Good. So thanks everybody for coming. My name is Marcus Miller. I'm the director of the Gordon Snellgrove Gallery here. I want to remind everybody that we're on uh, Treaty 6, Territory Homeland of the Métis. It's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, David LaRiviere here and his uh, stable of artists. That's the wrong word, right? It's not a stable. That is correct. It is correct, It is right? the wrong word. But, but right, because <laughs> this is an artist-run center, and artist-run centers do not have stables. Right. And, and artists are not horses. Equine. But I'll leave it for David, really, to introduce the, uh, the artist here. Uh, Dave, David Rivere, as many of you uh, already know, is the artistic director of Paved Arts. He's been there since 2008, where he's responsible for developing, implementing the vision, the direction of the organization's artistic program, and uh, its residencies. And all three of these artists have been on your latest residency, right? Uh, over his tenure, uh, David has curated uh, six full exhibitions. I thought it was more than that, David. I think it is by now, probably. It is, right? Uh, it might be an old CD. I don't know. It's, it's an old thing. <laughs> Many full exhibitions, uh, and he's uh, contributed critical text to, uh, for other artist-run centers across the country, including AKA, Art Space, Latitude 53, Modern Fuel, Niagara Artist Company, and Skoll in Montreal. <clears throat> David holds a BFA degree from uh, the University of Alberta and an MFA from uh, Goldsmith College, University of London. And I just want to uh, mention a few things. Uh, tonight is the opening of this show, Lines of Flight, at 8 o'clock. <laughs> and, uh, and, and also there's an opening at AKA, Next Door, with uh, Susan Schantz. Uh, um, who's uh, collaborating with uh, Leslie Rubin Kunda, who spoke here last week. Um, so I just want to mention before I get down that David will be presenting a paper based on the research that he's done for this exhibition uh, uh, this coming July uh, at the Deleuze and Guattari uh, Studies Conference at the University of London. So take it away, David. <laughs> So I'm going to try to keep my comments very short because we only have about an hour and I think that with each of the artist presentations of 15 minutes, uh, it'll be important to also leave uh, some time at the end for um, uh, discussion. Uh, I would like to, um, first of all, thank uh, all of the artists for your uh, work, your energy. It's It's been, uh, I have to say, um, maybe the singular most uh, energetic uh, cluster of uh, artistic activity that we've enjoyed at Paved Arts, and so uh, we'll remember it. And, and of course, um, Carrie Ford, so thank you. Um, I just wanted to say maybe a little something about the uh, concept of the project. Uh, it's an unusual way to go about curation to, to actually uh, float to call for submissions uh, first that already has a kind of a thesis forwarded, but the thesis is also kind of unusual. So this notion of a line of flight, which uh, in some ways is poorly translated because it doesn't have anything to do with flying as much as uh, all three of your projects have to do with aerial perspective. It's more flight in the sense of escape, and it's uh, escape really in terms of uh, escaping this kind of ordinal sense of identity. If we think of ourselves and our bodies, uh, like Spinoza uh, thinks of this question of what can a body do, uh, it's an unanswerable question because what it is is an assemblage that is never fixed. It's constantly changing. And it's entering into composition with uh, other bodies. And, it's, uh, and as such, like even the borders of a body are constantly shifting and changing. So what we have here are three artists who each of them are in themselves multiplicities. Um, and as such, they have entered into composition with each other. And like a rhizome, in an a-centered way, not in, the, not in a centered, centered way of the ar arborescent, not in this way of a tree with its radiating branches, but in this a-centered way where the connections can actually come in from incalculably different angles and exit in different ways and um, and uh, and basically this is uh, the experimental project that we have engaged so 
Um, without further ado, I'm not going to say anything uh, too much uh, biographical except that um, all three artists, I, there's no attempt in this exhibition to unify uh, their work or to uh, uh, synthesize it. Uh, there's absolutely no attempt. At, I think that what is a kind of a, a joie de vivre about this project is that it celebrates difference. And in that, there's um, this affirmation of all, all of your projects as multiplicity, but also this really neat uh, interleaving that occurs where it, uh, the experiment has actually carried you into collaboration and into a really fruitful uh, exchange with each other. So uh, this is uh, Lou Shepard, and uh, Lou uh, uses the, the uh, pronoun uh, they and um, the non-binary uh, pronoun. Uh, this is uh, Shahir Tarar, and um, I'll let uh, you each speak to your own projects. And uh, Shahir is, um, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> if I say something, then I have to say everything about it. Like, uh, uh, and this is Andrew Mays, uh, and he's a pretty good chess player. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm also into chess. Oh, <laughs> I, 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 were, have you played each no. other? <laughs> so, uh, um, what I, it's flown out of my head, uh, the line of flight out of my brain. What order did we decide on? Yeah. I think Andrew, first. Okay. Okay. Thank you, David. Yeah. Thank you. So we're gonna we're gonna sit and talk from the computer so we can control here. So if I am now in your line of vision, uh, you, now's the time to, to take a front row center. So I'm gonna put a timer on so I don't blab on. I can give you a warning as well. Sure. 12, yeah. 1208. Uh, okay. Yeah. Let me know before the hook comes up. <laughs> Well, yeah, I want to thank everybody for having us here on Treaty 6 Territory. I um, was really excited to see the call that David put out like two years ago, I guess it is now, that we all responded to because um, it was really, um, you know, in, in, it was really, there's a lot in it. It was really uh, thick and a lot of uh, theory and things to kind of play with. But it was also, you know, it really focused on, on the lines of flight and like, Oh, play. And it really sort of focused on allowing the projects to develop and grow, which I think is really exciting when you're applying for something, because so often when you apply to have a show somewhere, you have to have a nice, neat little package that's all wrapped up. And you know, many of us have ideas and ideas for something, but we don't know until we get to the space. You know, you you don't know until you're actually here and you start working on the things so as to what that'll look like. So I was, I was kind of keeping that a lot in mind. So I'm going to pull on a whole bunch of different things here to kind of sh to show the sort of like the development of my thinking and the, and the sort of the path that I've been on and how some of these things, this is helpful for me too, to, to sort of see, because I'm a generalist, uh, an aspiring generalist. I don't really have one medium or one way of working that I do. But after you know a few years of sort of doing this, you sort of see these these through lines that are making these connections, and, and and the process that I've been doing here has been really helpful in that. So it all started off with this painting. Uh, anybody know the name of the painting? Yeah, yeah, uh, by Marcel Duchamp. But I always thought it was a beautiful painting, um, and I thought it it uh, it was there was a pun in it because it was. It was a painting, it's a new descending a staircase, it could be paint descending a staircase. And I always wanted to pour paint down a staircase and see if I could get it to stiffen up and then you just have this sort of flowing of paint. Uh, but what Marcel was doing in that painting was sort of re uh, reflecting the photographic medium of the time. Because photo photography was you know, in its early stages of development. And um, Moybridge had just been uh, developing it so that you could see motion and capture really fast motion um, and nudes and nudes yeah yeah so there's a nude descending a staircase on the right there's a couple guys uh, scantily clad boxing so in this painting he was sort of capturing the three-dimensional movement 
and representing that as a pain. And when I was, you know, failing at trying to get paint to descend the staircase and then be stiff into the staircase, I, I poured it on a canvas on a staircase and then flattened it. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting. It's much more interesting as a flat image because you're kind of, it represents a figure now. You're sort of seeing that flattened space. It kind of harkens back to what Duchamp was doing. Um, and I ended up submitting this to the RBC painting competition, and I was selected, and they were going to give me $1,200 to fly around trip from Nova Scotia all the way to Vancouver for the ceremony. And I had just finished my jobs, so and I decided I'm going to buy a rail pass for 600 bucks, which is something that all of you can do, and that's two months travel on the train. And then I had an extra 600 bucks to kind of do like a mini residency. So I did that. And I got onto the train and took the all the way across, which if you've done, it's an incredibly amazing opportunity to do so. And it's a big slog, because it's a really big country. And when I was on the train, I was thinking about all the things that the train means to Canada. Here's uh, stills, or these are all individual shots. I would call this portrait of a freight train, where I was trying to capture every single freight car as it passed by pressing uh, on my phone as it passed, and you were kind of getting a sense of the resource extraction and, and the commodities that are being shipped across the railway, because the railway was always about making money, uh, making profit from the resources, and, and, and creating a nation was sort of something that came out of it. So I was really you know, romanticizing the railway, but then I started thinking about the colonial legacies and how this at this time, the railway in this straight line carved a, a line across the country and really kind of shaped the nation that we're in. So here's some panoramic photography that I was doing, um, looking at how as the train's moving by and you're moving the camera, or maybe you're standing still by the side of the road, that top one's in Saskatoon, just on the outskirts, when I was on the trip. It's sort of the, the photographic process of creating the panoramic on the, on the phone is kind of condensing time and space. And I started reading into like people like Shibble Bush and these other people who talk about how the beginning of cin the cinematic process, film and all that kind of stuff, the moving picture, was around the same time as the railway. And there's definitely some similarities in terms of that, de that development that developed the way that we see things. When people first saw trains going into stations, they got really scared because no one had seen something that big move that fast, sort of in that sort of straight line, and there was this whole perceptual, perceptual shift. And they didn't know how to look out of the windows of the train, because they're only moving 30 kilometers an hour, 30 miles an hour, or whatever it was, but the, the foreground was moving so fast that their eyes couldn't focus on that. And that, we had to relearn how to see at that time. It was a whole process. So I'm sort of thinking about that um, in contemporary age, because now we have all these photographic processes like drones and cell phones in our pocket that shoot high def video and these panoramic photographies. And I'm thinking about the new ways that we're seeing and the sort of the glitches that are inherent in this. So these, none of these photos are edited. They're just um, taken with the panoramic uh, photograph. And I was thinking about how the railway you know, shaped the notion of the land, you know, own your own farm. Here you've got the, the brawny dude rolling up his arm to get down to work in the, the terra nullis, you know, thinking about how the railway hired photographers and painters to kind of uh, show this open landscape that needed to be filled by the settlers. Um, and there's a map of the uh, sort of the Dominion land survey, the grid, and all that green area is, is, is property that the railway was given um, to build the railway. So yeah, I think a whole lot, lot of things there. And that kind of got me to the sort of the process of where I was thinking, and then I saw David's call, and I was thinking about how the aerial lines of flight, the aerial image, also sort of changed the way that we perceive the world. because. Um, until that time, you had to climb a really tall mountain or tower to be able to see from above. And with the development of the camera, we were able to hoist these cameras up into the air with balloons and kites and see, you know, this is from uh, Dieppe and it's a battlefield. So it totally changed the game of war 
um, and we were able to see much more. And uh, you know, so often these technologies are developed by military <coughs> uh, industries. So I was thinking about how that aerial um, shift also affected things like the, the settlement of land and war. And I'm a kite flyer. It's another part of my practice. And I thought I would apply to um, to bring a kite. In. So. That brings me to Saskatoon. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so here we are. Very satisfying. Yeah. <laughs> so I started to like scope things out, and I'm thinking about the aerial photograph and stuff. But as I was doing reading, I'm realizing that we're beyond photography now. Like our sensory perception, our visualization has gone way behind photography because now we've got these satellites and these digital composite sat nav maps and all these things that um, we take to be you know a reality but in in uh, in all reality they're not little that should play so um, this is me kind of floating around in the Google Maps there's the billboard of paved you can kind of see it, and you can see that as you're going in and out, it's actually two different, two different billboards. So there you've got the matriarchs of media, and now you can see as you zoom out, there's another one. <laughs> so here we're seeing these glitches in between the two as we're floating in from, this is a street view map, <coughs> and then when you zoom out, you're getting these composites that are taken from all kinds of different satellite uh, maps that Google is doing. So I thought there was something really interesting in, in that. And um, here's some stills. So you're kind of seeing both of the billboards and like buildings disappear and the cars kind of get stretched. So I thought there was something really interesting in, in seeing these glitches. And I you know, we talked about having the billboard as, as the place for my work to exist, so I thought it would be really interesting to take a kite, take a camera, and see if we could sort of recreate that space, um, but doing it through the, the method of kite. So there's lifting the kite, there's a little kite mount that I created out of some paint sticks. And there we are flying the GoPro 360 camera. So this is a little video that gives you a little sense of where we are. There's uh, Lindsay and Anya, they're shoveling, they're brushing off the solar panels on the roof of paper <laughs> to get them nice and sunny. So this was a really gusty day, and I think for this video, the camera map kind of got all jiggly, so it's really all over the place. Um, but there you kind of see what's going on there. And then this is the 360 camera, so now you can kind of like shift it around and make this kind of weird sphere. So this is uh, Nick and I flying on the roof. Big thanks to Lauren, Nick, Carly for all helping me fly kites, which was, which was really helpful because um, it was not an easy thing to do from the roof of pa uh, paved and... Uh, and uh, and AKA and, and the coffee shop, they also let us get access, and uh, Primal across the street all let us up on the roof, which is really nice. How am I doing for time? Uh, you got uh, about four minutes. Four minutes. So I'm not too all over the place, but I'm pulling in lots of things. This work is really new, so I'm kind of like pulling in all these different things, and I feel like it's just been such an, a time of. of coming up with all these ideas and pulling all these things together that I'm really excited to see where the work kind of goes from here. So in all the reading that I've been doing since I've been here and leading up to it, um, look, there's these, some great books, I'll show you them at the end, but thinking about how the aerial photography also, this is the blue marble, one of the, probably the most shared image in the world, uh, was has been really used by environmentalist groups to sort of show the whole world and we all can hold hands around the world and we should be peaceful um, and all these sort of notions but then also kind of um, where was I going with that? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I can't remember where I was going with blue globes or galia. But thinking back to our perception and, and visualization and, and the role of artwork playing this. So here is a painting by Monet um, called uh, oh, Crescent oh. Sunrise, I believe. Thank you. And you know, this is in the era of London, where you're seeing the, you know this beautiful sort of sunrise, sunset. And the color that is in this image is is due to the coal smoke. So there's something happening in here. And I have a quote that I'm going to read so I can articulate. And this is from this is from Nicholas Mursoff, who wrote this book called How to See the World. Just as with Impressionism a few years earlier, unloading coal is constructed from an unusual mid-air viewpoint. Perhaps the view from a train window as it crossed over the river heading to, the, to Paris. As we saw in chapter four, the moving images is often seen to be the precursor of cinema. Monet here made the moving world, modern world into a still. This freeze frame accounts for the strong sense of movement in the painting, giving coherence by its overall, overall warm tone, the subdued yellow hue, which is the product of coal smoke. The degradation of the air is again seen as natural, right, and by extension beautiful. The changed world is now built into our senses that it determines our very perceptions, and so it has become beautiful and aesthetic. If beauty is what is known as aesthetic, art here produces a sensory and aesthetic to the actual physical conditions. So in a sense, art here is playing a role in sort of normalizing that coal smoke to be the way things are. And if you've all heard about the Anthropocene and this notion that we're in this climate crisis that's created by humans, I'm thinking about being, I've been reading these texts and like thinking about the criticality of that because it's not all humans that have created this mess. It's a very particular group of humans that have benefited from this environmental degradation. And lots of people have been actively fighting against that from, you know, from as long as people have been doing that. So thinking about the artworks of Bertinsky where you've sort of got this mid-air viewpoint where we're sort of floating above but you are also got the sublime and the spectacleization of these images, which we are then sort of taking for the new normal and thinking about it in terms of like, this is just inevitable human progress. So here you've got uh, Monet's coal smoke. So again, you've got sort of the railway bridge and the people looking down, looking at these workers from below. So the sort of aerial viewpoint, you're looking down at these people that have to do this labor and this sort of relation. So, so, so there you go. A minute. A minute, thank you. So there's, so there's something about that anesthesia, uh, anesthesia? <laughs> uh, there with that, this sort of aerial imagery that Bertinsky is using that, um, I didn't want to really recreate that in my work, um, but it's sort of like, you know, with the kite and this aerial photography, it's hard to not sort of like play into that. So there's something, there's something about the kite that sort of is in this interim zone where I, you know, the, with the drone that Bertinsky's using with the airplane and this high resolution, really masterful photography, it's sort of like this mastery of this image, right? And we're we're showing this notion of human progress and it's sort of a beautiful spectacle. With a kite, it's, it's going to be all over the place. We don't know if it's going to be windy and it's kind of like dangerous and it's, so there's, and we're also holding onto this very fragile kite string that's keeping it all abound. So there's something about the kite which flies in opposition to the wind that there's sort of like an interesting relationship to it. So, there's the three books. Against the Anthropocene by TJ Demo is really good. Rebecca Solnit with that Betsy Lanthony uh, has been also really helpful to get about my bridge. And Nicholas Mirsoff, uh, How to See the World. Three really helpful books. So I'm just going to like walk off now. Here's a little <laughs> video I made. 
with uh, the page arts copy of the Anthropocene, which no one <laughs> had opened yet. <laughs> and I call this opening, trying to, unwrapping the Anthropocene with my dominant hand while the other hand watches. So, you know, you're holding the iPhone, <coughs> this sort of visual sensory technology, kind of watching my hand trying to open this. <laughs> It's really absurd. We don't have time to watch the whole thing because it's like, it took me yeah. like two and a half minutes to open this. <coughs> well, um, indeed, that's a, that's a good Huge idea. Idea. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but thanks, Andrew. Yeah. yeah. Who's up next? That's me. Blue Shepherd. Yeah. <clears throat> I will likewise talk from here, so if you, uh, if you can't see, um, you can um, I like to introduce myself with this image because it's just my face over and over again, um, which is kind of fun. My name is Lou Shepard. Uh, I'm really grateful to be here sharing my work uh, on Treaty 6 territory. Um, I'm actually from Nova Scotia, uh, or from the East Coast, uh, which I more recently learned uh, is also called Yamagi. Uh, and so part of what I'm really interested about in my work and part of what I really think about a lot is how language shapes the way that we understand our environment, how language shapes what we see, how language shapes uh, what we actually can perceive. Uh, so, so thinking about that shift from Nova Scotia to Mi'kmaqi, I often think about the fact that when I grew up, I was told that the place that I lived uh, was a place that, that privileged my culture and my heritage, my own Scottish settler roots. Uh, so no, Nova Scotia was all about bagpipes and, and kilts, and, it made sense that I was from there and I had this idea that like my physical body was rooted in that land. And thinking about the shift of, of thinking about myself as a settler on that land and the implications of my body uh, settling that land and what it means to change the name, like just, the, just the name of a place from Nova Scotia to Mi'kma'ki uh, and, and the, the sort of heritage and cultural legacy that that evokes uh, has been the focus of the work that I'm doing here in Saskatoon, strangely enough, for, for in Treaty 6. So, so I'm going to talk about that a little bit as I go on, but I want to put that out there that like, that's sort of the central theme of what I'm, what I'm thinking about is the way that language uh, orients us in, in land and in place. Um, so continuing on from that, continuing on from sort of what Andrew's been talking about, um, in terms, of, in terms of that idea of, of how we see and how, how what we are given shapes how we see, uh, I'm going to give you like a little brief overview of my work uh, and then end on the work that I've been doing here. So this is a project called Continental Drift. Uh, if you start up on the top, top edge, I don't know my left or my right, but you slide up over there. Uh, that's me in Paris, uh, January 1st, 2018. I was super heartbroken. Um, I just left a marriage a couple of months beforehand, and I decided that I needed a way to kind of ritualize that this space of, of uncertainty and of like breaking up with someone. So I shaved my head uh, on January 1st, and the idea was that I was going to let my hair grow back uh, throughout the entire year. So if you look on the bottom, bottom edge over here, that's me on December 31st, 2018, just a couple months ago, and that's how, how much my hair grew uh, in that year. The reason I did that is because uh, I came across this analogy that continental or tectonic plates move at the same rate as human hair growth. Uh, and that you might have heard that, uh, and of course, like any analogy, it's like, it, it's, a, it's an elastic analogy. <laughs> it is and isn't true. But I thought it was really interesting to think about my body as a geologic clock, or like this idea that I could keep geologic time on my body, and also that my body uh, might be, might rub up against that language of geology in a kind of like liminal way. So this is my hair after, after uh, one year. And these are also my fingernails, um, because also your fingernails can be comparable to the shift of tectonic plates. 
So that's one year of fingernail growth. Uh, glad to be done that project. <laughs> that's a really good introduction to like sort of what my work is all about. Um, so this idea of language and about how language orients us in landscape and how language teach, like shows us what to see uh, led me to a project a couple of years ago uh, working with the idea of the Antarctic. Uh, so this is a, a map of the Antarctic coast. Uh, a very particular part of it, the peninsula of the Antarctic, and it's very blown up, so this is one of 40 <coughs> traced drawings of that, of that uh, area. And what I, what I was doing is I was asked by this group of uh, artists and scientists to, to travel to Antarctica uh, with them to make a piece of art that reflected on the experience of the Antarctic uh, and what culture in the Antarctic and like artwork in the Antarctic might look like, which is like such a funny thing. So I decided to approach this idea of the language of scientific data and of sort of satellite imagery and mapping. And we've, we sort of are oriented towards understanding the north and the south uh, here in the kind of center. <laughs> we were oriented to understanding it as a place that we see through satellite imagery and that we see through mapping and that we see through scientific data as something that is like breaking up, that is melting, that we're losing. Uh, and so I was curious to play with that language a bit and to see what else we could find just in the language itself. So this is uh, essentially a metaphor. I lay a musical grid over the coastline of, of, Antarctic, of the Antarctic uh, Peninsula, and then I transposed it into music. So, oh, I'm not hooked up to speakers, but you'll hear it a little bit. So this is this, uh, this sound playing uh, or, or it's sort of like the musical staff playing as we go. I'm going to end it there. It's well, 17 minutes long or something like that, so you're welcome to check it out. I can give you links. Uh, that's a photo of me playing it in the Antarctic. <laughs> um, I, I'm not a huge fan of getting my photo taken, but I always like to include this because when you say you've been to the Antarctic, people are like, really? <laughs> I'm like, I was there. Um, so that experience of working with this idea of scientific data and language around ice and this kind of mythology of ice that we have uh, and this idea of ice as a kind of marker of climactic uh, apocalypse uh, made me really fascinated with what our kind of perceptions of ice could be. So I, I began working on this project uh, called Requiem, sorry, that past project was called Requiem for the Antarctic Coast. The idea that the Antarctic Coast is sort of something that we think of as dying or as dead. Um, and this is called Requiem for the Polar Regions. And so I'm going to just switch to the internet here, maybe, yeah, if we can do that. Drum roll, please. Yeah. Yeah. So, maybe. It's working. It's working. So, <laughs> sorry. Maybe not. Uh, oh, here we go. Yeah, it's working. It's just really slow. Uh, so this project uh, takes satellite or daily, actually it's microwave imagery, of, of the uh, sea ice of the Arctic and the Antarctic, and it translates it to music and transposes it to, to a musical grid, similar to what I did in the Requiem for the Antarctic. I don't think we're actually going to get it to play, because it's not quite loading up on the, on the screen. Uh, but I encourage you to go, if you're curious, and check it out on the internet, um, because every day the composition of these two bodies of ice shifts and you can hear as they're kind of moving through and what they're doing, right? This is actually taken from January of this year. So the ice of the Arctic is fairly robust and the ice of the Antarctic is uh, fairly, is shrunken quite far back. Um, and the white dots are where the, the algorithm, the computer program is actually playing the music from. Uh, and so with that, I'm able then to think about the language that we talk about the Arctic and the Antarctic in, or the sea ice in, as musical score. So if you look here, uh, this is taken from <coughs> this is taken from January 2019. This is the the, the coastline or the, the like sort of contour of the ice uh, in the Arctic in January 2019. Uh, the ice, the sound gets lower the closer to the pole it becomes. So the shadow and ghost image behind this that you can maybe see is from January 1st, 19. Uh, 90, which is the first time that these images became available to us. And so you can see actually that it shifted down in, it, in this like 30 year span, uh, an entire note, or a kind of like more than a note. So it's kind of an interesting way to shift that way of looking at things and the language that we have to talk about things uh, into a whole other 
sort of form of language. So, yeah, if you're curious to take a look at that website, I, uh, I can give it to you. I apologize, it's not working. But this idea of language uh, and how language shapes how we understand ourselves and understand our landscape led me to think about this project called, uh, or, the, or the, my next project. This is a text from the, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. Uh, which is what psychiatrists use to diagnose uh, originally that they call mental disorders. Uh, now they have all sorts of like other ways of talking about that. Uh, but essentially, this is the, the, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual's uh, diagnosis for gender dysphoria, which they now categorize as an acute stressor in someone's life. I was looking to obtain this diagnosis, actually, because I was hoping to, to uh, get access to, to health care specific to transitioning. Um, and so I was working with a psychiatrist, or I was like, going, like trying to work with a psychiatrist to actually obtain this diagnosis. So I had this diagnosis available to me to read, and many people in the trans community are really, really aware of this text because it's something that shapes all of the ways that we have to interrelate inter with the medical system, or if we choose to. Um, so I had this text, and I knew that when I was seeking this diagnosis, I was going to have to match my experience and my gender identity and my sort of understanding of myself to this text, which I think is super fascinating because then when we talk about trans people, this is actually like how we are, the language we're given to understand and read trans people and gender, which is like pretty, pretty interesting. And when you actually look at it, you kind of start to see how reductive it is. Um, for example, like, it, it, it's pretty, it's, it's, at certain points they even ask about like, did you play with toys of the opposite or another gender as a child? And you're just like, oh, for heaven's sakes. Um, but, <laughs> I mean, obviously I did that. Um, but you start to see repeated in this text the, the line, a strong desire. And of course, like being a theory nerd, this idea of desire is so fascinating. Like what is desire and like how does desire operate? And how does desire operate in relation to identity? And how does desire operate in relation to like wanting to interpolate an identity or hail an identity into being uh, through language? So I decided to look to the rivers of this text, uh, the in-between spaces of this text, recognizing, of course, that this text describes a very particular way of being and that there is multiplicities within it. And so the rivers uh, and spaces in between I took uh, and notated with a, with a dance notation. This is called Laban notation. If anybody's done any ballet, they, you might have bumped up against Laban. Um, but it's a way of notating movement. And so I took uh, all of these movements that I was able to, to find in the sort of spaces of the text, and I translated them to a score. And this is a score for a dance piece, uh, which then I, ha I worked with a, a performer, Lily Davis, uh, and we performed. Or they performed. Four minutes. language and how language shapes or how language shapes how we think about environment led me to <coughs> two texts that I find really interesting in relation to sort of settler Canada. Number one, the Dominion Land Survey, which Andrew already talked about, um, which is like how land is, is divided uh, legally in, in the prairies. And the second one is this poem that I pulled out of a, uh, Susanna Moody's handbook for settlers, uh, Roughing It in the Bush. And so the Dominion Land Survey, <coughs> I'll come back to, but this poem comes out and it starts to talk about ways of looking over the landscape from a surveillance perspective, or like ways of coming into a landscape and having this experience of wilderness and awe and sort of meeting this sublimeness uh, in, in landscape. And so I'm quite critical of that perspective, like probably you can tell that already. Uh, and I wanted to think about how this text begins to deconstruct. So I took the um, punctuation from it thinking about those punctuation points of mark moments of colonial lookout, 
So basically, Moody describes a landscape, uh, and then she, she breaks her line, and she allows us to then look out over the landscape that she's described. Uh, and I, I decided then to take these and move them into this idea of surveillance or markers or survey markers in the gallery itself. So <coughs> the poem itself, the punctuation of the poem itself becomes a survey map, a surveyor's map, for points in the gallery. Um, I'm going to skip this part because you should come to the show and I'll talk about it again. And then the idea of the Dominion Land Survey likewise becomes this, uh, well, I don't know. I was really interested in this idea of correction lines in the Dominion Land Survey, thinking about the way that this text actually starts to glitch against the landscape. And so I've been going around with Andrew and Shakir and we've been like going to correction roads to actually experience like what this liminal glitched space in this grid that is laid over over like this planar grid that's like laid over a curved earth is. Uh, and so I, I, I'll leave you with the, the sound piece that I made from, from that, if I'm thinking about that. But this is our like, sort of major highways in Saskatchewan, and you can see that there's corrections on them as they attempt to uh, travel north-south of that grid. And so I made a piece uh, called Correction Lines, and this is just the actual corrections on those major highways. And I notated those from the, pre uh, I notated the latitude and the longitude, of, or latitude of each correction as frequency. And so it's a, it's a kind of ongoing sound piece that plays in the gallery space. And I'll just like let it play while I leave the stage. <laughs> <laughs> In that dance piece, um, yeah. the breathing, yeah. was that the dancer's breath? Was that yours? That's my breath actually clipped from reading the text over and over, and then it's just the clips of breath that I had to take. Okay. So it's like a way of also notating that negative space in the text. Yeah. I never mentioned that because it's my contribution, I'm always like, yeah. And then on the wall, you had to describe the negative space of the DSM? Uh, yeah, on the wall, that's the, that's the dance score. Cool. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Shahir. Um, I'm super grateful to be here on, on Treaty 6 territory. Um, I think it's kind of curious that we refer to this land um, by the name of a document, um, because so much uh, of my work is about how um, how the, the sort of central tenant of the colonial order is forcibly imposing documents onto lands that are much more complex, um, and and so that idea um, uh, uh, sort of governs a lot of my work that you'll see later. Um, I'm from uh, Toronto. Um, I'm, I'm an immigrant to this settler state called Canada, um, and by extension also a settler. Um, and um, originally I, I grew up in, in Lahore in Pakistan, um, right when the war on terror was, was spilling over into the country. Um, so the, I, I sort of talk about all these identities because um, they, uh, they remain on the peripheries of my work as I, as, I, as I make it and spill over into it. Um, so. Uh, I'm going to sort of talk you through uh, my my sort of research and work process as I go through it because I I think I think that's the most exciting way to experience it. Um, so so before I started doing the kind of work that that you will get to see at the gallery, um, uh, if you come to the opening tonight, um, uh, I sort of had two central concerns. Um, one of the one of them was 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 that of the public domain. What is um, sort of material that we all own? Um, that exists outside the capitalist economy, um, and how can we circulate such media? Um, and the second concern I had um, was I've been reading a lot of reports about um, about sort of the ir irreversibility of, of, of climate change. Um, I'm sort of super pessimistic about that, and and like I uh, and, and just growing really concerned about the oncoming climate migrations. How how it's inevitable that um, hundreds of thousands of people will have to move within the next decades, um, and how unprepared we are for that. Um, and so 
um, essentially what I wanted to do uh, was sort of combine these two concerns and see if I could uh, find a way to assign narrative form um, uh, to these ideas that I had. Um, so, uh, so the public domain part of it, um, I, 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 I grew up, like I found, um, I sort of got, was getting into like satellite imagery or like looking at public domain sources, and I found this satellite called Landsat 8, um, which is uh, run by NASA, um, and it uh, uh, sort of, it's sort of temporal uh, resolution, which means how long it takes to get back to the same place on Earth is 16 days. So every 16 days, it takes a photo of the same place on Earth, and that photo is uploaded online, and it's public domain. We all own these images. Um, and using these images, I decided to look at um, an ongoing migration at the time, which is the migration out of Syria. And essentially, I wanted to see if um, this, uh, this migration, which is otherwise so hard to sort of wrap our head around, um, if, uh, and yet it, it, its magnitude it is so great, if that's something that's observable in aerial images. Um, so what I, uh, so some of my first experiments into doing this were uh, sort of reading up news reports about um, sort of conflict zones in Syria and then uh, migrant, uh, sort of refugee camps in Europe and uh, to see if I could find some kind of correlation between the two. Um, so on the right um, is the city of Homs in uh, western Syria, um, and this is Calais, France. And the sort of two places I want you guys to look at um, is sort of here. Uh, so this is uh, the th so this is France. Um, this is the English Channel, um, and this is the the town of Calais, and this is their sort of. Um, uh, where they throw what is it called landfill? This is an area which is the landfill, and this is the this is Humps, um, sort of the center of the city over there. Um, and at this moment in Humps, which is on the right, um, the Syrian uh, there have been a lot of sort of demonstrations against the, the Syrian government in that town, and the Syrian government had decided to launch a campaign uh, against the demonstrations in the city, um, and so very soon. Within, uh, you can see the dates of the photos below. Um, so this is May 1st, and by July 4th, um, you could already observe a lot of the vegetation um, in the city uh, uh, sort of be destroyed. And then you can start to see, um, it takes a while to get um, to, 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 for these images to become legible, um, but you can see uh, plumes of smoke emerging from some districts and, and the district on fire. Um, and then, within a few, within some distance of that, you start to see the emergence of some sort of blue structures on top of the landfills um, in Calais. Um, and, and you can see the blue is more pronounced there. So what this is, is um, on top of the garbage mound, um, refugees from the Middle East have been using the garbage to construct, construct a tent city for themselves. So essentially taking what the people in the city have thrown away and using it to build a small town for themselves, um, and, and many of whom were of Syrian origin. And over the next um, few sort of years, you really start to see the camp grow in size in such that it starts to almost uh, get to the scale of the town, it's, of, of Calais itself. Um, and, and so now, like this is sort of my first experiment, and um, I found that uh, this migration was observable in aerial imagery, um, and I wanted to now start to fill in some of the gaps in between these two locations that are otherwise 4,000 kilometers apart. Um, so, on the left is the Evros River, um, and this, this side is Turkey, and this part is Greece. Um, and uh, this is the Bulgarian-Turkish border. So this is Turkey, uh, so this is Bulgaria, and this is Greece. And these sort of govern, these sort of form together the only land border from the Middle East to Europe. Um, and what you start to see in these images um, 
is sort of the emergence of, um, of, of, of natural obstacles to people as they were, natural and man-made obstacles, to people as they were starting to move out of Syria into Europe. Um, so around the same time that the Everest River flooded, um, there was uh, border fences being built along this border to prevent the movement of people um, out of Syria, uh, which meant the only way for them to leave uh, was uh, through the Mediterranean Sea uh, using sort of rafts and um, with the help of smugglers. Um, and so uh, what started happening was that they would, instead of being able to reach the Greek mainland, um, would be stopped at the, uh, at the, Greek, island, the Greek islands by the migrant detention regime there. Um, and you started to see the emergence of migrant detention centers on the Greek islands. Um, and then, uh, like the, the rise of Fortress Europe wasn't sort of limited to Europe. Um, Fortress Europe moved, was moving into Asia. Um, and this is here is Syria, um, and, and this, is, uh, this is Turkey. And if you look along here, uh, this one's kind of hard to see, but you start to see a wall emerging uh, along Syria's very borders. Um, and, and this was really interesting to me because here was a wall being built, this was in 2016, a 9,900 kilometer wall being built between two countries, and yet um, that didn't captivate Western imagination. What captivated Western imagination was ISIS, or spectacular violence. Um, and so uh, this sort of tied, um, and so, and so this sort of tied into this um, thing that I'm reading about and thinking about called slow violence versus spectacular violence. There's a great book by Rob Nixon called Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Queer, um, in which he talks about how uh, it, it, it's really the kind of violence that we want to presume um, and be captivated by spectacular violence, violence that's immediate, that's, uh, that's visible, as opposed to slow violence, which is dispersed um, along sort of space and time. The construction of this wall is something that's dispersed a lot across space and time, and we don't want to speak of it. Um, yet, uh, um, yet ISIS is something that does captivate our imagination. Um, so sort of following this wall along, this is Turkey, this is Syria, um, you start to see uh, what um, what this wall, the, the, what this wall is starting to sort of fulfill its purpose, which is to stop the movement of people. Um, and if you zoom in, uh, this is Turkey, this is Syria, you start to see people pressed against this wall that's being built. Um, and so here are cars and, and cattle um, of Syrians who are trying to get across into Turkey, um, but they're prevented by all sorts of obstacles. Um, and this occurs if you look at the satellite images, all uh, um, across Syria's northern border. Um, and if you sort of take a closer look at, at these images, you'll start to see um, that they've formed clusters, uh, little groups, which, and, and these little roots that are sort of forming uh, through them, which indicates that they've been there for some time, and it's almost the emergence of these sort of small villages or towns that are pressed against, uh, that are that are sort of counterforms to borders. Um, but at first it might appear that um, these migrants themselves are the sub subjects of these photographs, um, but what they actually reveal um, are the infrastructures that are built to stop them. Um, here you can see sort of trenches, um, earthen mounds, and fences being uh, built along the borders. And just across the border, um, you start to see sort of these like car, like winding car tracks, um, w which indicates some sort of like chase that, some sort of chase by Turkish border guards as they would cross the border. Um, and so really what these photographs are doing are revealing infrastructures to us of violence uh, and infrastructures that um, attempt to sort of contain um, and detain people that are otherwise so hard to see. Um, so, so getting back to how I use that to, to make my work is um, I sort of collect all of these images um, and sort of intersperse them 
uh, or punctuate them with other footage and um, uh, news reports that I've collected um, to sort of combine them into, to sort of give a narrative form to violence that's otherwise um, dispersed across space and time or concealed under bureaucracy and, and legally used in documents. Um, and uh, uh, to, to see the work itself, um, you have to come to the show. Um, <laughs> but it's called Falling Archives. Um, How is it called? Sorry? How did, did you say it's called? Falling Archives. Um, and it's, it's a 30-minute it's a film that, pre uh, that plays across three um, frames. Um, uh, I didn't get a chance to take any photos to show you, but maybe that's good. Um, and yeah, that, that's it. the name of, of the book uh, about um, um, spectacular violence. Yeah, it's called Slow Violence um, and the Environmentalism of the Poor. Oh, thank you. All right, well, um, thank you all for your presentations. And uh, of course, we want to open the floor to uh, questions. Uh, I uh, hope that wasn't too abbreviated. I know it's a very short time to uh, uh, condense uh, to talk about one's um, practice, but um, it it strikes me. I guess the temptation is always to sort of seize upon uh, where one sees uh, uh, commonalities. Uh, so I want to be careful to kind of uh, skirt that in a way because. Um, but I I think that that it's remarkable. Uh, that there is, it, like, in Lou's project, this um, uh, they are looking at uh, um, text, at, uh, poetry, at the uh, selection from the DSM uh, that are uh, very problematic text, uh, but uh, where um, it you know, uh, part of the problematic aspect is this encounter that takes the text at face value, uh, that just accepts it for its authority in the case of the DSM-5 or, uh, for, you know, as this a word of an authority uh, or, uh, you know, accepts all the romantic tropes of the poetry. Or, uh, so there's this kind of concerted, a, a deconstruction, but also, um, discovering other possibilities that have become productive. Um, and then um, with Shahir, with your presentation just now, uh, I, I think there's this concerted sort of, again, we are all of us kind of inculcated in this realm of Google, uh, of Google Earth. And uh, so we're so uh, kind of numb to these images, but to um, actually uh, drill down on uh, the the uh, movements and to uh, observe, uh, you know how how it is that um, that there are. Um, so I'm rambling on. I actually I'm not asking any questions. <laughs> uh, uh, so, but I, but I uh, I wonder if um, you know. Uh, I wonder if I could convert this into a question. Uh, um, uh, so, uh, so how are you? <laughs> uh, no. Um, does anybody out there have a uh, question for the arts? Questions for the arts? Yes. Please. This is uh, basically uh, a question about uh, this project and also the statement that you made about the Anthropocene project was that do you guys feel that the, the media, and then particularly the Anthropocene project, actually, kind of, you're talking about normalizing things that are nor not normal by artists through aesthetics? Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, uh, as, I don't know who's seen the Anthropocene project, but it's drew these big, gorgeous photographs of environmental destruction. Yeah. So, is as the media are artists 
to kind of contributing in, in some sense to the normalizing of tragedy? Yeah. You were sort of speaking about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's what these texts are, are definitely saying. I mean, in Against the Anthropocene, TJ Demo sort of says, looks at the, the various other terms that we're using, the capital scene, the petrochemical capital scene, you know, like looking at these different ways of, and that goes back to language in terms of naming this, because uh, calling it the Anthropocene and, and is this generalization uh, makes it so that it's just part of this normalized process and it's part of the, the necessary progress of humans. So I think, I think yeah, media and I think artists are playing a role in that. I mean, it's, it's really complicated. Um. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I was going to say, like, my, my, my problem with the Anthropocene and, like, sort of that Edward Paczynski, uh, Sarah uh, Bakiwal show is, is not even so much that they normalize it, but in, it's, it's so much about sort of bearing witness to these changes that you feel, without pointing fingers to who's doing it, mm -hmm. um, that it evenly distributes guilt for the Anthropocene, um, where we know that it's uh, like a small, that, well, we know that the Anthropocene won't be distributed evenly, the poorest, most vulnerable people um, will face the worst of it, and the rich are building bunkers. Um, so, and, and, and to me, like, I, I hate the idea of bearing witness because it means that, like, when Bangladesh is underwater and when the Amazon is, is gone, like, we're still going to be standing here bearing witness going, like, whoa. Um, and also, yeah, it's just, like, yeah. I, I think it's, I think it too, like, what, I mean, and I haven't seen that show, but I'm familiar with Brzezinski's work for sure, and I've seen, like, the, the, like, promotion of that show, which is pretty over the top. Um, I think that there's like a, a kind of desire to like encounter the sublime in that imagery or like a desire to kind of like situate humans in relation to this idea of the sublime, which is problematic in terms of like, so, sort of like what Andrew and Shahir have both said, wanting us to be overwhelmed by these images and, and these, this sort of spectacularization and then not actually uh, talking about what the images mean. And so there's this kind of just like, wow effect that happens and you're sort of set set there and i mean like what else happens when like we start looking at images of environmental destruction as as sublime like what happens when we encounter those with a sublime experience like we begin to translate or like sort of like place all of our all of our like understanding of of nature and and uh and like our experiences of sort of like the sacred and like we begin to like place them into this context of environmental destruction so it's like pretty it's a complex issue, but like that show is, I think, needs some heavy, some heavy look. And I mean, this is interesting, right? Like, this is a show that's, this is a show that's very separate from like what artistic discourse in Canada is happening like at this kind of level. So like that show happens at this sort of like nationalistic discourse, this kind of like propaganda of Canada's like art <laughs> production. And then like here's three Canadian uh, artists who are like, I, I say that because like Canadian is also like such a strange term, but. Um, here's three artists who are who are setting out to like talk about that in very different ways. So, I think I think yeah, it's a kind of it's a funny thing. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask Boo about the um, about your relationship to music and right. your choice as uh, to use musical language, whether it be dance or sound, um, to um, sort of extrapolate. Uh, meaning from from your texts. Yeah, like so. The so my relationship with music actually, I just I have like a kind of uh, affinity for music. I don't have a musical back. Like I'm not trained in music, but I'm interested in this idea of gesture and this idea of gesture like broadened from just like the idea of like actually a physical gesture and the idea that that languages that are gestural in terms of pointing rather than describing. So like music or, or, or dance tending to, to work more within that where, where these languages are more about pointing to something than they are about like actually defining something in concrete terms. But I think like always when you're shifting between languages or you're like translating things into other languages or, or, or however it is, uh, you're operating with like you're operating within the boundaries of the language's own like ontological structure, so like its own baggage, its own history. And so like when I use musical notation, 
like the ones that I do for the Polar Regions Project, like that's a that's a very particular language that has its own history and its own like history of violences and history of erasures and histories of like of of privileging a particular idea and a particular way of hearing even. So I think it's it's like kind of curious to shift these things and like I often think about them in terms of like making a metaphor between two ideas that that then reveals a space of like of lacuna or like a space of, of not untranslatability between these two language structures. But then your work seems like it's all about translation or the impossibility of translation. Yeah, I think, yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, the music and the dance is, it, you know, can be understood as a kind of non-representational yeah. language, right? Yeah. It's, yeah, that's, a, that's, yeah. I, I often, I often use that very thing in my artist statement. <laughs> okay. my, my question's for Wu also with the polarregions.net. Um, was that a whole, that's a whole like computer program you built? And yeah, I mean, I didn't build it. I mean, I did build it with a, with a programmer, okay. uh, but I got a grant to, to work on that. So he, um, I, the programmer worked with me to actually develop this, this uh, program. Uh, and the idea was that it, that it, the idea was that it kind of fills in for me as like a translator, and so it's this this continuous automated like uh, production, and so it's yeah it's it's continually translating all of that as we speak. So if you go on, it'll change tomorrow with day to day, but it uh, yeah yeah and and that is like something important for me to say is that like a lot of my work happens with the in collaboration or like in relation to other artists. Like obviously Lili is performing that dance piece. Uh, I often work with musicians that are performing the scores that I'm like pulling out. So so it, it's certainly like not happening. Like I'm not I'm a, I'm I'm just sort of like a, a node in a in a thing. So the music's being played by the program as well. Like it, it interprets this as the notes and then plays it as well. Yeah, it just plays it as MIDI files. So it also sounds a bit tinny and weird, which is kind of fun. Um, or, or like it just it's it doesn't actually sound as rich and as full as like a musical composition does. But then sometimes I may I take the scores and musicians will take me up on playing them, uh, and then I ask the musicians to further interpret that like as as they will. And so I've had cello players really work with these like very like icy sounds that they wanted to kind of pull out. I've had piano players like really want to like dig into that really stick, like staccato and syncopated rhythm. So it just depends on what the what the musician themselves is interested in. But. Is it archiving every all of these like every day too? Yeah, yeah, you can go back to nineteen ninety and hear them. So for every yeah, so there's like every day of the year for since nineteen ninety. You can hear what the ice sounded like, I guess, or like this like representation of it. It really strikes me that, you know, the idea that this uh, uh, grouping of artists has something to do with aerial perspectives seems so completely beside the point to me in a way because it's really the criticality uh, that you share in your approaches in the sense that, you know, we're talking about Bertinsky and talking about the art world and there's this kind of uncritical, uh, even seductive aspect of like to commodifying this, uh, um, you know, horror uh, into like basically turning it into kind of a beautiful abstract painting in a way. But there's this kind of necessity, I guess, uh, maybe, uh, well, most definitely a necessity uh, to, at this juncture, uh, with the, um, you know, the, the horizon of uh, global warming or climate change, uh, to uh, not fall into that kind of uncritical trap as uh, as artists is, is that uh, fair to say? Yeah. Uh, I have a specific question uh, uh, for Shahir because it's something that you uh, shared with me uh, about your your work too, and it ties a little bit into what what Lou was just talking about as well. But um, you you said something about the falling archive. What constitutes the archives? And I wonder if you could share that with, with folks. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so the uh, 
so my last film was called uh, Falling Border, um, and I, I, I sort of got the idea of falling from uh, this text by Hida Sterl uh, called In Free Fall, um, where she sort of talks about uh, uh, how, like, how, we, how there's sort of no horizon anymore in art, where horizon used to be like a really important part of painting, but now the horizon with, with sort of Turner and now more sort of aerial surveillance perspectives, that the horizon um, is blurred or has given way or, or is destabilized. Um, and so th that's how I use the word term falling, the falling part of it, which is to sort of destabilize something. Um, and the word archive um, I'm using as sort of a uh, or, or thinking about the National Archive, if you think of like a building or a structure uh, which contains documents. Um, but um, the way I use the term is that uh, the archive isn't limited to the building. Um, to thinking of the archive as like a, net, like a repository of um, histories and memories that the state offers its subjects. And so, um, such as the archive that is offered to us by Canada, or like the archive that um, the, the country of Pakistan offers to me back in Pakistan, um, which is sort of, uh, which tells the people who live in that place how they should, uh, their relation with each other and the space that they live in. Um, and then with, uh, and then the emergence of sort of counter archives which destabilize the National Archive, which is what the film is about. Um, in, yeah. in Syria, and that, that second archive is really of, uh, of the resistance to this national archive. Yeah, like a vernacular archive which sort of pokes holes in the national archive um, and in turn destabilizes it. Vernacular. Yeah. Questions, comments, queries, concerns? Uh, uh, I got no other alliteration. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting overview from visitors on our prairie province and city. I enjoyed the both the very highly personal, the broad national perspective, and then international is on top of it. So it's very, very different and very diverse. And yet all three of you have used technology to your own benefit to essentially explore it much further. It's a very interesting connection though with these three different perspectives. I really enjoy that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you mentioned um, you've collaborated on stuff while you're here. Can you talk a little bit about that, maybe? Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about that? Uh, sure. Well, we've, we've gone out to uh, several of the correction lines, which Lou was really interested in checking out. And um, <clears throat> yeah, when, when I sort of proposed the lines of flight and thinking about the aerial perspective, I didn't really have a specific thing that I wanted to do while I was here, and uh, and often thought about collaboration with you know with people and, and what is what happens when you when you capture that from above. So it was a perfect opportunity to kind of go out to one of the correction roads and see see what we did. So we did a thing. <laughs> <laughs> we caught it on camera using the kite and this, this really fun way of um, sort of uh, lose walking of the correction road um, and the kite string was sort of like the way that the the, 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 the one take unedited shot kind of happened with the um, you have to kind of see it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to give okay. much away. Yeah. Yeah. Well I guess I guess that that like it's interesting to have that comment I think that gentleman just left but um, it's interesting to have that comment about like all of us not being from here uh, and all of us coming to like look very specifically at the ways that this place is and is seen and I mean of course like it is really also interesting to be like we're looking we're looking at at places through this aerial perspective like also as like, people that well I don't have an experience of this place and like and so part of what I've been really curious about is like what is my body in this place like what is my like how does my body operate and and like what how does my body score this landscape like how does my movements through it begin to become a score of the landscape or like a way of surveying land which is like some work that I've been doing but then with Andrew it's like just really fascinating to go out and like I mean really practically to like go out on the fields and be like oh like we don't know if we're in somebody's farmer's field <laughs> or like we don't really know if this road is public is it public but like going out and then people just like waving at us as we're going by and like flying by it's like it's like march and like minus whatever and we're just like okay but i mean so it's like really interesting to think about being bodies in the landscape in that way but then also to kind of think about the way that my body as a visitor here uh 
works and like what what story my body tells, but then also like the ways that my body moves over the land. So, so we like we are looking at this liminal or the I, I would call it a liminal space or a glitch space that happens in these correction lines. Of course, like the it's not a liminal space in the land. Like it's people's homes and fields and and like it's fully just like land that is that is that is there. But I think it's that kind of idea of like what's the what's this like difference between and it's kind of like similar to what Andrew's trying to do with like moving or not trying but doing between like moving between the the like glitching between like an aerial to a street view. It's like well what what is this kind of movement between a, a forced grid or like a grid that's laid on top of a of a of a living landscape and then like the actual experience of the landscape. So yeah. Yeah, because I mean for me it's been thinking about how and I think both of the others have spoken of too, but like thinking about how we think about ourselves in relation to this colonial project of Canada and thinking about you know all of the things that we've talked about, whether it's the national iconography, the artwork or the grids and just the simple roads on the land. Like we're just trying to think about how we see these things and more and more our vision is mediated through screens, right? And these phones and and all this sort of this technology. So how do we learn new ways of seeing like they did with the railway and the moving cinema cinematic image and the aerial photography now how do we sort of learn to re-see ourselves in relationship to this land and the, and the history with the various nations on this land, but then also how do we see ourselves in relationship to this technology. And there's a beautiful quote by this guy, oh, what's his name, King Solver. He's behind a project in England called the Dark Mountain Project, and he was an environmentalist for 20 years and saw all these, like, you know, fought all the wars and, and they had these big wins and all these things, and then 20 years later we're like, fuck. <laughs> like we still don't get it. We are still like just full steam ahead to this precipice that's gonna end. It. And 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 he he started this this dark mountain project, which is this kind of pagan ritualistic kind of go back to the land, get our fingers into the blood, into the mud, and and do all these things. But one of the things that I took from some of the writing was we don't need a sense of hope anymore. Not a sense of hope in like the sense that this technology is gonna save us, or these sort of things. We need to be critical of these things and learn how to see in them, but he sort of says, what if we sit with the sadness and the grief that comes along with knowing how screwed things are? If we sit with that sadness and this, then that darkness in the dark, you know, we, we close our eyes, we stop looking at our phones and everything, stop looking around, and we sit with that darkness, what happens when our eyes adjust to it? Like what happens when we actually see the darkness for what it is and that sort of grief and that sadness? Is there something within that that will give us a new way of seeing, right? Instead of just hoping to, looking at those bright screens and hoping that that's going to be the same. So there's something going on. No. Yeah. 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 Thanks to Jim and Thank you very much. Yeah. And hopefully a new billboard by the time I get back. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there she is. Yeah, I'm glad. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.